So <laughs> I ain't I, I've never really told a lot of people this story. So I got down there, you know, first day, you know, rookies show up. They kind of explain to you how everything works and, you know, all the rules and stuff you can and can't do. And you can fill out the medical form. So I went through there trying to be honest as possible. Any heart condition, yeah, I got a heart murmur. Next day, trainer called me over. He's like, uh, I got a heart murmur. So yeah, I've had it since high school. He said, well, we're going to send you to my team, our team doctor, which he cleared me. He said, I don't see no problems, this, that, and other. But the Texas head trainer, which wasn't there, wouldn't clear me. Really? Yeah. So they pretty much said, uh, I was just sitting in meetings, and they come to the tablets and they see you, just like this. We didn't see you. He said, go, we're going to send you back to the hotel, great stuff, put you on a plane, send you back home. Wow. He's, got, yeah. He's like, because all this stuff. What's happening, y'all? This is Mike D with Black Fathers Now, where we're bringing the village to the brothers. Every couple of weeks, you can look forward to a quick inspirational message or a thought-provoking guest with knowledge and wisdom all geared towards helping you be the best father that you can be. We're bringing the village to you. Now is your turn to do something with what you learn. All right, y'all. Let's go. What's going on, fellas? This is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You with another episode of Black Fathers Now. Now, dig this, man. We have a really powerful conversation. We got a brother who's gone through some twists and turns and all of that, but ultimately, he's actually living his purpose right now. And that brother that I'm talking about is none other than my frat brother, Chavis Smith. You know, Chavis is a husband, he's a father. He's an entrepreneur. He's a former football player at the University of Tennessee. And we'll talk a little bit about that journey and everything. And But then he navigated, had some twists and turns to ultimately step into his passion. And now the brother is killing it. So <laughs> fellas and ladies listening to, because y'all like to tune in to what we're talking about, let's welcome my man, my dog, Chavis Smith. What's up, brother? What's up, Dawson? <laughs> How you doing, hey. man? Good, what you so? Man, I can't complain. Man. You know, taking everything one moment at a time, no faster, no slower, brother. That's how we roll. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's what's up, man. Well, dude, man, you know, I gave the intro, and we're going to jump into your story in a second. But before we get started, I always like to have the brothers give shout outs. Because when you think about a movie, all the important people in a movie get mentioned first. And I like to do that with the movie of your life or the movie of our conversation. So give some shout outs to the folks that basically allow you to be the brother that you are day in and day out. Well, first, I'd like to give a shout out to my Lord and Savior, Jesus, who has, you know, has grounded me, has kept me, uh, has always been in my life since, you know, a young age. My mom didn't, she didn't play about that. So I'd like to give him a shout out first. And my wife, she don't, she, she comes second to none. So. And she has been there from day one, supporting me, has kept me grounded as well. And you know, my mom, my mom has, uh, she has been there since day one as well too. So I'd definitely like to give her a shout out as well. And all my kids, I'm just let them know I love them. Mm, that's what's up, man. Look, God, wife, mama, and the kids. Like, bro, I, I think you, 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 you did a, you did a pretty good shout out, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, so. So thinking of that, and you mentioned, you know, your wife's been there since day one, but mm -hmm. I want you to take it back, man, to the origin story. You know, you're originally from North Carolina, correct? Four City, North Carolina. All right. So so talk to us a little bit about growing up in Far City. Talk about, you know, some of the inspirations and some of the things that basically, you know, helped to mold you into the brother that you are today, you know, growing up. Oh, boy. Four City, it wasn't just, this, it was... It wasn't ghetto. It wasn't hood. It was just a little small town called Grimtown. That's the neighborhood I grew up in. <clears throat> and growing up there, man, it was, it made me who I was, bro. Because, you know, you got the older guys. Like, you want to get out there and play some ball. I'm 12 years old, and they 19, 20. But they're going to treat you like you're 19 and 20. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be crying and whining and going home, running to mama, this, that, and other. So it made me tougher as a, as a young boy back then. So it kind of molded me to, into who I am today. You know, that, that drive, that go get it, you know, nothing's going to get in my way. 
Mm. That's like still. Mm. So basically, it's just kind of like so you grow up in an environment in which you basically were, you know, you were forced to kind of man up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? At an early age. Yeah. And and so for those that are like, you know, watching the video of this or just listening to the conversation, you're only seeing Chavis from the neck up. This is a big old joker, too. So I could also assume. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> so if you're watching the video, he's he paying down. Chavis is a big old brother. So I would also say that you're probably a little unique versus other folks in which you were probably 12 and as big as the uh, the 19 to 20 year olds as well, too. Right. It's just, I was telling my son the other day, I said, he's 15. I said, dude, when I was 15, I was 260, 270. He was like, what? I said, yeah, boy, I was fed well, boys, as a child. So I ain't missed no meal, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so it's not that just because you grew up in Grim City, you got treated like an adult. People saw you coming and they were like, this joker got to be about 24. I was like, no, nah, he's 12. And so- yeah, man. And it's like, when I played baseball, man, I was better at baseball than I was football. So my mom literally had to carry my birth certificate everywhere we go just to prove that I was 12 years old. Now that's the crazy part. <laughs> <laughs> that joker, look, people get tats of everything. That joker said, I should have got a tattoo of my birth certificate on my arm so that y'all can believe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And, and so love- and you meant to say what now? I loved it. Oh, yeah. But I mean, it's cool, though. And, you know, and see, I grew up in Augusta, Augusta, Georgia is comparable in size to maybe like Knoxville, Tennessee. So it's, and that's where we currently live now. And so Augusta is not a big city, but it definitely is, um, it's probably bigger than Grim City, like where you grew up, but it's not, it's definitely not a big city. So you kind of got that small town vibe as well, where they got the neighborhoods and, you know, you got land and space and, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think it's more so the mentality than it is the area, right? So we were kind of country, you know, you had the gardens and picking stuff off the trees and eating and, you know, you yeah. just, you have that, that, that mentality. But I think that's something that we miss today with the new technological advancements and growing and this and growing in that. We miss sometimes the simplicity of those yeah. things that we had growing up in smaller areas. Yeah, I know when I grew up, man, we had to, we didn't have the washing and dryers. You know, my grandparents, they washed clothes by hands and you hung them up out, outside on the, on the clothes line. You know, I was out there garden picking beans, you know, picking greens, picking all that good stuff. Mm. So I grew up with iPhones and PlayStation 5s and different things like that. So you, you, couldn't text, you couldn't text a friend. You couldn't FaceTime. You had to go outside and wait on them to come out. Now, oh, look, you couldn't text them. You had to go outside and wait on them to come out. And if it took them too long, you know they was in trouble. My mom yeah. was my side. <laughs> <laughs> I can't come out today, boss. <laughs> uh, I can't come out today. And you had to yell through the screen door to get to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. But no, but but that's but to me, those are it's it's interesting. Those little nuances mean so much to us. And at the time, we took them for granted. You know what I'm saying? I know I did. Like to your point, you mentioned picking greens and beans. You know, my granddad had a garden. And I sit down and my cousins and I talk all the time how we used to have little battles on the floor when grandma would have us shelling peas. We'd be shooting peas across each other on the floor there. You know what I'm saying? Like those little memories. But then it's like those are things that I don't forget. I can't remember what was bought. I can't remember stuff, but I can remember those experiences. And so for those that are listening that grew up in a small environment, that grew up in the country, a small town, you probably have these things, these little memories that maybe growing up you thought were minimal. But mm-hmm. as you become older, those are things that really are like experiences that shape you. Yes. Yeah, because I, you know, I sort of helped my granddaddy uh, dig graves at the age of 12. I was telling my son about it. I was like, bro, he had a tiller, you know, he'd till down about a foot or so. You had to get in there by hand with a shovel, mm-hmm. shovel it all out, man. It'd take you three or four hours just to dig a grave. And you know, six foot, and then you mm-hmm. had to go back, cover it by hand. So hold on, was, hold on. you you can't you cannot gloss over that. So at twelve, you were helping your granddad dig graves. Talk to me right. a little bit about that. Yeah, because this, you know, we didn't have we didn't have no backhoes. So mm-hmm. he, and like I said, we grew up. We wouldn't we wouldn't poor poor, but we was close to it. So mm-hmm. you know, we get with a tiller. He till down about. You know, about six six inches or so, and you got to get out there and shovel that dirt out. 
So it out, well, he kind of marked it out to like the casting would fit down in the hole. Mm-hmm. So we get out there and dig it out by hand, and then have to cover it back up by hand. And now was your, now was your grand? Was he was he like a? Did he have like a funeral home or something? Or why was he digging graves? No, he just he was basically kind of like contracted out to a, a, a funeral home. Okay. So that kind of was the edge. Could you come out? We got a body we need uh, to be buried. So we go out, set the tent up, and then uh, the vault men would actually come later on after we got it and set the vault in there. And then, you know, they have the arrangements and everything. And after the family leaves, we drop the casket, we'd, we'd cover it all back up. Wow. And a question. When you sit there and think about that, how does that, because I'm thinking about me at 12, right? And yeah. at 12, you know, at first, I mean, I don't like to go to funerals now, but, you know, I can deal with them now as a 41-year-old man. But at 12, it's just like, I didn't want to go to funerals. I wasn't dealing with all that kind of stuff. But at 12, you were helping your granddaddy dig graves. Yeah. And he, he he's another person that, that made me who I'm today, man. Just that work ethic that I have. I go hard. And it, he's always said, if you want something in life, you work for it. So mm-hmm. I started working at 12. Started buying my own clothes, my own shoes, all that stuff, man. So that's what I am today. I work for what I want. Mm, I work for what I want. And you started mm-hmm. digging graves at 12. That's, it, it's just, I think we're going to come back to that in some capacity. I don't know how, but something about that we're going to come back to. Because to me, that's it's interesting little nuances that really inform a person's mindset and how mm-hmm. they operate. Like you mentioned, you know, you're going to work for it. But it also informed me to the notion of you're willing to just do what it takes. And I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. I don't care how it looks. If this job needs to be done, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I went out just running the streets, you know, kept me, kept me safe, kept me from out of trouble. Mm-hmm. Really, really appreciate that. Because at an early age, I started like nine, about 10, 11 years old, I started stealing. Mm. So, and that, I guess that was his way of, you know, let me, let me get a hold to him and take him under my wings and show him, show him how it's really done. So it's supposed to be done. Hold so on for that. So now, hold on. Say so now, you 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 skipping over stuff. I said, tell me the origin story, and you told me a little bit about it, and then you jumped over, and then you you sprinkled <laughs> in. I was digging graves at twelve. Then you sprinkle in again. Yeah, when I was like nine or ten, I started stealing, and so to keep me from stealing, my granddaddy got a hold of me, and he started helping me make him. I mean, he started making me help him dig graves. Pause and think about that, fellas. I hope y'all are listening to what just happened. You know. Chavis just said, you know, he was starting to go left a little bit when he was a little boy. I mean, you know, we all have our moments. Mm-hmm. And what happened was his granddaddy stepped in and said, no, nah, boy, <laughs> you finna come with me for a little bit. And he started yeah. making him dig graves. Like, I, I, pause and think about that. I'm stealing. I'm getting in trouble. Like, okay, I'm now going to make you start digging graves. Mm-hmm. See, you, you know, it's interesting. What do people tell you when you start, uh, like, if you get into the dope game or something, what do they say it's going to end up? It's going to end up in one or two places. Where? The grave. Or, or there it is. And so you started stealing. So instead of your granddaddy telling you you're going to end up in jail or the grave stealing from folks, he was like, no, nah, I'm going to make you dig some graves. I'm going to show you where you might end up at. I'm going to show you. See, see, this is, dude. This, the title of this podcast is called Black Fathers Now. And it was interesting. Like, how, how old do you, do you uh, is your grandfather still alive? No, he passed. He passed some years back. Right? Years back. And so mm-hmm. I would assume, I mean, your granddad was probably born in the 20s or 30s, something like that, yeah. right? Yeah, like, uh, yeah, but I think it was like 1916, somewhere along there. Oh, wow. So yeah. I want y'all to think about that. This black man, his grandfather, saw that he was going left. And instead of telling him where he could end up, he came and showed him where he could end up. And he also instilled some work ethic in him by doing so in the process. And I was just saying that because as black fathers now, a lot of times we think about how do we show up as men? How do we show up as fathers? And a lot of times we feel like we got to tell people. We got to tell them how to do this and tell them how to do that. We got to give people the game. Sometimes the game is not to be told, it's to be shown, right? And your grandfather, a brother who was born in roughly 1916, yep. was showing you the game. And I just think that's a powerful example of the strength of Black fatherhood because 
that laid the foundation for your work ethic going forward as well and kept you out of trouble. Yep. It is. It, 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 it taught me the value of a dollar, too, man. It really did. Mm. So, and I really appreciate it. Man, dude. And, and so what's interesting about that work ethic, you know, inspiration, you know, help from the outside, from your grandfather coming in, really, you know, taking the, an interest in you. But then you also mentioned in the community, you know, the, the older fellas treated you a little older, you know, partly because you was a big old joker. But then the <laughs> other part to it was, you know, they were just helping you to become a man. Yeah. And I also know that, you know, you ended up going to play football at the University of Tennessee. Right. Mm -hmm. So talk yeah. to me about how some of that then also helped you in your athletic journey and how that kind of came into fruition. It made it made me mentally and physically stronger. Mm. You know, once I got to UT, I was no longer the bigger guy no more. Mm. So it's time you got to really man up as a freshman. So it, it kind of took me back to my childhood to where these guys is much bigger and stronger than me. So I got to go even harder in paint. And it, like I said, it wasn't no crime, none of that, man. They, they, I mean, they'd foul you. I mean, like, during it, put, throw you to the ground, you better not call foul. Mm -hmm. If you got to run, you off the court. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's, so it, it made, made me tough, for sure. Mm -hmm. It made you tough, but it is interesting how experiences in our lives tend to prepare us for what's to come, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of that was in preparation for you to – be somebody who got to a point in which, you know, you're heavily recruited and you got options to go to college. Now, did you have people before you go to college or were you the first one in your family to go to school as well? Yeah, first one. So you're the first one to go to college. So you've given these examples, you had this environment, this family structure and all of that. Then you, you know, become a good athlete. And all of a sudden you're now this guy who got options, right? You can go to now. What were the I know you chose UT, but what were some of the other options that you had coming out of high school? I had a uh, Clemson, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, uh, about every every school in the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, no, no, no. There wasn't a lot of other schools in the SEC. Yeah, gotcha. mostly ACC. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, and then, what made you choose University of Tennessee at that point? And what year was this? Is what two thousand ninety? What was this? No, uh, well, I came up here in ninety eight when they when they won the national championship. They beat Florida. And okay. They kicked and missed the field goal. Mm -hmm. and sitting about, I guess about fifty. I'm on the fifty yard line, about halfway up. Mm -hmm. And they kicked and missed it, man. And I'm like, these people are crazy. And they sort of rushing the field. I was like, I'm not going out there. But you really have a choice because you got a hundred plus thousand people mm -hmm. pushing you. So I ended up on the field as well. They mm -hmm. turned the goalposts down, turned grass up, and we was leaving. They carrying the goalposts down Kingston Pike, and I was just like, this is crazy. This is where I'm going. <laughs> but back up, I went to North Carolina on my soft my sophomore year. They was actually recruiting my brother uh, for a visit, so I went down there as well on a visit with him. And that's I was close to going there, but I, once I came to uh, Knoxville in '98, and saw that. So hands down, this is where I'm going. This is it. This is it. And so then, so then you transition. So again, like you said, you're the first one in your family to go to school and all of that. You got this opportunity. You go to UT and you play football. Talk to us a little bit about the journey, but then also talk a little bit about, you know, I guess transitioning from college. And then did you you try to get to the NFL too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I, I'll start by saying uh, I got all my recruiting and everything, and I was lazy academically, man. Just, just wasn't all there. I just didn't put forth the effort like, like I should have done and end up going to Fort Union Military Academy. Mm. So I went to, for – I think I was there for about seven months. When I say it's out in the middle of nowhere, bro, I think it had one red light for about 20 miles. Wow. Little convenience store, little pizza place, and that's all it was. So you couldn't just hop up and go home mm -hmm. <laughs> every weekend. Mm -hmm. And it was it was really structured, man. I mean, you up every morning at 6 o'clock, every morning, seven days a week. Wow. Well, I basically went there to get my grades up. Okay. So after about, I guess about... I guess about six months there, I finally finally got my grades right to where they needed. Okay. But and then you were able to enroll in UT after that. Yeah, it was like the P. Uh, they call it postgraduate program. So okay, uh, any 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 kids that that wanted an extra year, basically of uh, of school before they went to college. 
So that's what I went to in 90 and got there in 99. Then I got the UT in 2000. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then you got the 2000 in 2000, you got the UT and mm-hmm. basically, you know, started playing football there. Talk to us a little bit about your journey at UT. And then you also sniffed a little bit going into the NFL, but then, so talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So when I got to UT, I'm thinking, man, look, I'm about to be the biggest dog out here, bro. I got there. It, of course, we have like a freshman mini camp. I think it was like three days. So all the freshmen come in. I'm about their size or maybe a little bigger. And then some of the seniors and juniors started walking in. I'm like, wait, I got to call my mama because I don't know where they grow their kids at. You know, you got uh, in this six eight. Will Alfred Husel, he's like six eight. I'm like, Albert Hainsworth. I'm like, where does these guys coming from? Uh-huh. Like, Good night. But, you know, it goes back to that mentality of back on the playground, bro. Look. Mm-hmm. These kids is bigger, stronger, and faster than you. So mm-hmm. I got to work twice as hard. Mm-hmm. So that's what kind of started my journey right there my freshman year. I, I didn't play a whole lot my freshman year. I played on kickoff return. And then I got to bragging the coach former one day. He's like, have you ever played in the office? I'm like, yeah, I was the best fullback and tight end there was. He's mm-hmm. like, all right, come see me. Got to his office. He was like, yeah, we're going to put you on office line. <laughs> see, <laughs> you serious? He's like, yeah. He's like, you get over there. If you don't like it, we'll move you back to defense. So all the seniors that was on, on D-line was like, bro, get over there. Don't learn that. Mess up as much as possible and then move you back. Man, I'm at the back of the line trying not to get in, trying not to learn that. Man, because I walked over there, Chavis. He didn't call me Chavis. Chavis, <laughs> I want you in at the ones, the twos, and the threes. I said, oh, my God. So he kind of forced me to <laughs> learn offense, which – I grew to love it because I knew both sides of the ball. Mm-hmm. So it really helped me out knowing both sides, which they changed our whole, our whole class. Like Jason Witten, mm-hmm. he was a defensive end. Rashad Baker, wow. he was a receiver. Wow. So Jabari Green, they moved, they moved everybody around, man. Wow. Wow. Everybody. So basically kind of mixing and matching and finding fits. <laughs> but you thought you were going to play on the defensive side of the ball. Coach Former. <laughs> Pulled you back and basically said, uh-uh, well, why don't you come over and play a little offense? And next thing you know, you end up loving it. Yeah, I did. I, I, I ended up starting the end of my sophomore year, mm-hmm. junior year. I ended up starting. So that was a great experience. And, I, and like running through, I'm going to tell you my experience about running through the team. Mm-hmm. So first game, I walk out there in pregame. I'm like, man, they talking about 100,000 people, man. I'm looking up at the state. I'm like, ain't nobody here, man. I could have stayed mm-hmm. at home for this. I went to North Carolina because ain't nobody here. Mm-hmm. So we go through the little warm up routine and everything. Go back in the locker room, man. I walk back out there right for the uh, before they open up the tee. I still get chill bumps talking about it, and you can see the jumbo trial from when we run out. So you see the band doing a little thing, and then you see the tee open up, and we just run out of it, bro. And I ain't never in my life heard a crowd so loud. Really? Ever? And man, I was my adrenaline was going so much so fast, bro. I had to go and sit down because I ain't never experienced it. Like I'm a little country boy. Uh-huh. <laughs> the same, man. Wow. So, in the Dallas, man, I made a great decision because this is amazing. Mm. And, and so you made a great decision, but then you also were opened up to an opportunity to then mm-hmm. go to the other side of the ball, which ended up being a great decision for you as well. And you said you ended up starting sophomore year through your junior year. Did you just your senior year as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so then talk to me about after that. So then you know, things go pretty well for you, and then UT is over. So what happened yeah. next? So then, uh, you no know, draft day comes. Uh, didn't get drafted, which, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, agent, a lot of people, a lot of teams kept calling, hey, have you got drafted? Have you got drafted? And now it's, it's, this is like six rounds, seven rounds now. So finally I went down and uh, sat down with my agent. And he's like, well, you got Baltimore wanting you, and you got the Ravens wanting you. So he kept negotiating the contract back and forth. So he's like, well, the Ravens going to give you Eleven thousand dollars a week, and uh, Texas is going to give you uh, thirteen thousand dollars a week. So we're going to go with the Texans. So that's how I kind of end up signing with the Texans. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so, so how did that? How did that whole process go? So <laughs> I ain't. I've never really told a lot of people this story. So I got down there, you know, first day, you know, rookies show up. They kind of explain to you how everything works, and you know, all the rules and stuff you can and can't do, and you can fill out the medical form. So I went through there, trying to be honest as possible. Any heart condition, yeah, I got a heart murmur. Next mm-hmm. day, 
trainer called me over. He was like, uh, I got a heart murmur. So yeah, I've had it since high school. He said, well, we're going to send you to my team, our team doctor, which he cleared me. He said, I don't mm-hmm. see no problems, this, that, and other. But the Texas head trainer, which wasn't there, wouldn't clear me. Really? Yeah. So they pretty much said, uh, I was just sitting in meetings, and they called me to Travis, we need to see you. Just like this, we need to see you. He said, go, we're going to send you back to the hotel, great stuff, put you on the plane, send you back home. Wow. Got- yeah. He's like, because all this stuff went in your medical record. So UT took all my heart stuff out of my medical records and didn't tell me. Really? Every bit of it. So got on a plane, got home, cried a little bit. I asked him back and finished school. So I got went over to UT and was like, you know, what's the deal with my medical records? And it was like, uh, not my problem. Those, those are his the trainer's exact words. Really? Not my problem. Wow. I still remember. Told me, yep, not my problem. So I've had a I've had a bad taste in my mouth for from them for a long time. Not hold on. So pause, pause, pause. So you had a heart murmur in high school, like you mm-hmm. got diagnosed or diagnosed, or they found a heart murmur, and that didn't stop your recruitment. That didn't stop you from going to college. No, because when I got when I got to UT, they you know seem to all these specialists. They're going to do surgery, this and the other. But the technology, it wasn't up to where it should have been. It was like a 75% chance of success. Mm-hmm. And my mom and my brother was like, uh, I was kind of kind of worried about it because it wasn't up in the 90s or close to, mm-hmm. you know, close to 100 percent So I really didn't go through it. So it's not like they didn't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. Wow. But they didn't list any of that in your medical records at UT. And so when you went try to go to the NFL. That they basically it basically looked like you were lying on your medical records or somebody was lying on your medical records, and so that's why they just said, you know, cut it, you're hiding something from us. Yep, yep. Ah. So, and you know, I was I was first contract with Texans was 250,000 a year, and it went up like 100 or 200,000 every year. Mm. Wow, so, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's crazy because you know. When you stop and you think about things that happen, everything in life happens for a reason, right? Like if you stop, you think about everything in life happens for a reason. And while we're going through something, it don't always make sense. You know what I'm saying? Because you just like, especially when it's not any fault of your own. See, that's the, and and I want brothers to really pay attention to that. I want the sisters listening to to pay attention to that. We're all going through something. We've all gone through stuff, right? But while you're going through it, it never makes sense. And you make it even more confusing when you don't have nothing to do with it. It's somebody else's doing that's causing all of this. And then you get that whole why me perspective. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So what so how did you so how did you deal with that? Like after that, when again it was not your fault, you know, mm-hmm. you were about to live your dream, you about to, you know, have a $250,000 contract initially. And that's before getting, you know, starting or doing whatever, which would possibly been in the millions and all of that. How did you mentally come to grips with that? It was it, it was rough. You know, like I said, I cried for a little minute. <clears throat> you know, talked to my mom for a while. She was just like, hey, that's not God's plan. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can't argue with God's plan. If it's his plan, it's his will, then it, I'll still be in the league. But he, he wanted me to go a different direction. So mm. went back and finished up school, got married, I had my first child, got married. So mm. wow. Dude. It, it was it was rough. I, I bet. I mean, because I mean, I could literally, I mean, for me, I'm still sitting here thinking about just the whole premise of, you know, when something's not my fault. Like I, I can kind of get it if I screw up. I can get it if it's something I do and it's like, eh, okay, I got caught, right? But <laughs> This was somebody else's negligence that mm-hmm. was kind of the cause of this whole confusion. And that's the part that would really get me. And so to your point, that's why I was really kind of harping on it, because I think a lot of us deal with things that sometimes aren't our fault, but we still got to figure out a way to deal with them nonetheless. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I kind of just I think going back to school kind of got my mind off of it a little mm-hmm. bit. It was always the pain has always been there. And back in my mind, it's like, and now I gotta find a job because I got a daughter to take care of as well. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. So trying to find ways to do that. And like I said, uh, it was hard. Mm. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. real hard. Just knowing that you just, just knowing I, I've, I've worked my tail off from the age of like, you know, 11 or 12 years old to get to this point. And I've, and I've always prayed, God, let me make it to the league. Let me make it to the league. Well, I made it. I made it to the league. I mm-hmm. guess I should have asked let me play in the league. Ah, uh-huh. <laughs> Be careful yeah. what you pray for. Mm-hmm. You I know, and, and, and go ahead, go say. I guess that's, you know, I guess that's why it didn't hurt so bad because I prayed to make it to the league. That's, I made it. I just didn't get to play. Ooh, you made it. You just didn't get to play. So you actually got what you asked for. Right. You know, and it's interesting. You said, they said, be careful what you ask for. And, and I think sometimes this is where we have to be careful what we ask for, not from the standpoint of something negative, but even mm-hmm. on the upside, because sometimes we sell ourselves short, right? Mm-hmm. You know, in the sense of sometimes it's like, well, God, just do this for me. Okay. He's like, all right, that's what you want. I'll give you that. <laughs> you know, but you just like, but you're selling yourself short. And so for me, what I'm learning in my life is like, yo, God, your will be done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I want your will to be done. Whatever that is, if it's more than I could ever imagine, I'm with it. If it's mm-hmm. nothing close to anything I could imagine, I'm with that too, because I just want your will to be done. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what happened. His, his will is what was done. Mm-hmm. And so, I, so what, what were you going to say? I can live with it. Yeah. 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 Well, and so what did you end up? So after that, from the standpoint of jobs and all that, what ended up, what did you end up kind of jumping into, you know, after that time frame? Because you said you had a daughter as well as, you know, you had a son as well. So what, um, what did you end up doing after that? Well, I had my son and my wife got married. And mm-hmm. then uh, we kind of figured out now just from job to job, you know, I, I carried one job for, you know, five, six years. And then I got on the Brinks. I was at Brinks driving the armor truck for 13 years mm-hmm. and about four months ago i decided to leave them and run my food truck full time okay hold on but see you can't gloss over this so in the midst of all of this see i know you so we can go we can go back and get deep but we ain't gonna get too deep but um <laughs> <laughs> so years ago it's funny i remember when we were i think either we were at your house or something and valeria your wife was talking about how good these doggone turkeys are that Chavis mm. does on the grill, right? And it was interesting. This was probably 10, 12 years ago, something like that. And mm. you, she was saying, Chavis is his turkeys on the grill. Or, man, y'all y'all can't beat them. Like, I ain't never had nothing like it. it literally, it's, it's the best turkey you've ever had in your life. And I was just like, mm, okay, and I got to test it to see what's going on, right? <laughs> and I tested it. I was like, yeah, yeah, this, this brother, he, he, he know what he talked about on this grill. But it was interesting. Again, you're working for Brinks, doing the armor security stuff, but you were doing these turkeys. And then all of a sudden I heard that people started paying you to do these turkeys on the grill. This was years ago, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you and I were talking and you were saying scenarios about like, yo, I, you know, I just I like the grill. I like the cook. And you know, every so often people will pay me to grill something for them or pay me to cook something for them. And mm-hmm. you mentioned years ago that if you could do anything, you were just like, dude, I would grill. Yeah, definitely. I, I started out a little Walmart grill, bro. You know, mm-hmm. we had a little apartment over there about five minutes from the house, and I'd mess up food. People bring it back. Hey, man, this food ain't done. Let's get here. I put it back on there for about five more minutes until eventually I just started getting good at it. You know, I'm like I said, it goes back to my childhood, man. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it right. And that's what mm-hmm. my grandfather said. If you're going to do it, do it right. Mm-hmm. Don't do it halfway. Mm-hmm. So that's what kind of led up to me grilling. So I had a little grill, and I was like, man, I really like this. Mm-hmm. And people, my neighbors, I ain't never seen somebody sit outside in the rain, sleet, and snow, mm. and buy the grill and just sit there and watch the food. Ooh. That's what I'm passionate about it. So eventually, people was like, man, you need to get a restaurant. I'm like, man, I don't know about all that. You know, I ain't, I ain't got the business mindset for that. But And then I was like, well, maybe maybe I can do this. So me and my wife was going to my son's basketball game and saw a big old grill sitting on the side of the road. I was like, baby, can I buy that grill? She's like, yeah, go ahead. So I bought the grill and just started doing little stuff here and there, catering. I did some catering for some Walmarts and different things like that and just kind of started saving up my money, putting my money here and there. And then kind of got my first truck built and started from there. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I need a bigger truck, man. So went out and had a, a, a sold out one, had a bigger truck built. 
Mm. So, so hold on. So you're, you're glossing over a whole lot here. And what this is was this is what's interesting. Again, so this is a brother who literally, you know, star athlete, whatever, went to UT, ended up having an opportunity to play in the NFL, but then he got cut due to a technicality and all of that. And so like dreams were squashed, went back to school, and then he just had to figure out a way. Cause like, yo, I got a wife, kids, all of that stuff. Now I gotta find a way to take care of myself. And in the midst of all of that you know, you developed a love for grilling. You developed mm-hmm. a love for cooking. You developed a love for doing this. And, you know, and it takes you back to, like you mentioned before, this whole premise of, you know, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. You know, my granddaddy had me digging graves. You know, I done, you know, the young, the, when I was the young dude, the old dudes made me step my game up. So I always had to basically step myself up and be the best version of who I am. So therefore excellence was always at my core. So even yes. me on this little, Walmart grill outside of the apartment in the rain, I'm doing this with excellence, right? Mm-hmm. And that range through and how you operate. But the thing is, you realize that you had a love and a passion for this thing. Mm-hmm. And you never let it go. Even with your job, you never let it go. That's yeah. the thing that I want people to understand. Like sometimes we feel like we have to just completely sell out and go in a particular direction. Not always. Right. If you find something that you love, just don't let it go. You can still have your job. You can still have your career. You can still take care of your family. But if there's something that gives you peace that Mm -hmm. literally fuels that fire inside of you, like grilling did for you, don't let it go. And the thing that's interesting, if you don't let it go, you start to create this snowball effect. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you glossed over, like, I went from a grill, and I got a bigger grill, and I did a little catering, and I got a bigger one, and I did a little more catering, and I got a small food truck, then I got a bigger food truck, but, you, but you're not telling folks that, okay, I'm now actually in business. I'm actually now replacing my full-time income doing what I love to do, and, <laughs> and I, I don't know if, uh, you know, you and I were talking on the phone before you decided to step out on yeah. basically step out on faith and i remember you called do you remember that conversation yeah, i remember i do mm-hmm. <laughs> and you you called and you were just like man i want you to pray for me that's like why man i think i'm about to uh i think i'm i think i'm gonna quit my job and step out here full time i was just like what took you so long first off and then he's like man i'm a little nervous about it i was like and we're not gonna throw numbers out there but i'm like no um how much were you making I'm like and you threw a number and i'm like well how much are you making on your job and I was like, oh, okay. And you were doing this full time before? And you were like, no, I was just doing this part time. And you were already exceeding what you were making <laughs> at your job. And then you were like, yeah. I was like, well, dog, what the hell are you nervous about? And so, <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was the funniest thing just to, because when you said it, it was kind of like a light bulb went off. And you were like, you know what? Real talk, I ain't got nothing to be nervous about. Like, <laughs> Right. My wife was like, hey, baby, can I put my notice in at work? She's like, yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. So I turned my notice in at work, man. It's been the best decision I've made in my life. And my because wow. I set my own schedules. So mm-hmm. one week I may just not have nothing. So my younger son told my wife, he was like, Mommy, daddy ain't got no job. She's like, Yes, he does. He said, uh, you talking about the food truck? I ain't no job. <laughs> wow. But you know, but you know what's so powerful about that? They say when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Mm-hmm. And yes. the seed that you are planting with your children is that they're seeing their father do that. Yes. They're seeing their father love what he does day in and day out. And also that thing that he loves is taking care of them very, very well. Mm-hmm. So you don't even understand, like you talked about the seeds being planted by your grandfather having you, you know, shovel, uh, shovel graves or the seed that was planted by the brothers in the neighborhood or in, in the country who were basically helping you to grow up and mature, the seeds that you're planting as father, as dad, by showing them that I love what I do day in and day out, my mm-hmm. attitude is better, how you operate is, I bet you, you interact with them in a totally different manner now because of the level of stress that you had mm-hmm. doing what you used to do is changed yeah. now. Yeah, because man, my son... He has saved me so much because he could, I could take his cooking and my cooking, and you never know the difference. Whoa. That's what he is. He's just as good as I am. He wow. can run my 
If I say, CJ, I'm going to leave you my food truck and let you run it, he runs just as good as I can. Wow. And t- so Chase, Chase, he's, he's the same way. He's he's wanting, he's getting that itch to where he's want to do what daddy's doing. Mm. So I'll let him season a little bit here and there and we'll let him run the window in a truck, you know, a few times just to see what he's going to do. But they want to do what I do. So like mm-hmm. I tell my son, I said, you, you got to be careful who's watching because there's always somebody watching and admiring you, want to be like you. Mm. But your mm. little brother, he admires you, man. So I said, so if I raise you right, Ain't, ain't a lot I got to do with Chase because he's trying to be like you in life. Mm. So. That's interesting, man. And, and I think, again, again, this is Black Fathers now and the power of example, right? You know, it's like your words and your actions match. They come together. So it's like, because, you know, we kind of grew up in that era of, you know, do as I say, not as I do, right? Like, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm going to tell you to do some stuff, but I, ain't, I might not do it myself, right? <laughs> we now, and I think that was kind of an era, uh, uh, an error in the era that we grew up in, right? Mm-hmm. I think now we've come to the realization that, yo, I got to say it, but I also got to do it because mm-hmm. them young jokers is watching and they're going to want to replicate what they see. Kids don't always do what they're told, but they mm-hmm. almost always want to at least try to replicate what they see. Always, yes. Definitely. Mm-hmm. That's how my boys are. Mm. And, and so, what were you gonna say? So they, same exact way. Mm. And, and so, speaking of your boys and, and speaking about fatherhood, man, you know, talk to us a little bit about your fatherhood journey in the midst of all of this, and how this, you know, some of the things that you've gone through from, you know, the disappointment with the NFL to growing up to going to college and coming back and finishing, and then the trials and tribulations leading up to where you are now. How have these things come back to really influence and impact you as a father? Growing up, man, my mom was pretty much all I had. You know, my dad was an alcoholic, never was in my life. Uh, so all I had was a mother's love. Didn't didn't know how to be a father. Didn't know how to love a woman. Had to figure it out on my own. So I made myself a promise. I said, you know what? I didn't have this as a kid growing up. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure my kids know what my love is. Mm. So I made myself a promise. So to this day, man, I love my kids dearly. I tell them daily, I love them. They tell me daily, daddy, I love them. Mm. You know, my stepdad, he was, he was there, but in and out, in and out in the streets, you know, mm. and my brother, I looked up, looked up to him just like, you know, my younger son looks up to his brother. So I want to be, I want to be just as good as him, if not better than him. I mean, he was a great athlete, great athlete. And I played with him my uh, freshman year in high school. Mm-hmm. He was a senior. I was a freshman. I played I played one defensive end. He played the other. So we always make these jokes about who's going to get to the quarterback fast. Uh-huh. Wow. But, but he, 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 showed me, he showed me some ropes and how to become a man as well because I kind of looked up to him a lot. Mm-hmm. And he, he ended up going to Catawba College down in Salisbury, North Carolina. Okay. So every Saturday I would go down there. I had my mom I had to take me down there every Friday night or every Saturday morning after the games, to make sure I was at his games. Mm. So you know, and becoming a father, me and my wife, well, I had my daughter. She was born in North Carolina, so I was kind of going back and forth to North Carolina trying to spend time with her. This it was kind of hard. And then my wife had my, my oldest son, and he's in home, so it's kind of different uh, raising a, a young man you know, to become a man. So I'm just trying to figure it out. And I'm like, okay, in my mind, this is how I was raised. So in my mind, I got to do things completely different as to how I was raised in order to raise him to be a young, a young man. Hmm. So it kind of just took me back to how my granddaddy raised me. You know, so you want something in life, you work for it. That's just like his freshman year in high school. He didn't play a lot. He's frustrated about it. I'm like, son, relax. You know, you're freshman, just... Relax. Sophomore year comes. Yeah. He started starting to play a little bit. And then broke he <laughs> broke broke his right hand. Mm. I think about the third game. So this past Friday, got the cast off his right hand, broke his left hand. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so wow. he's out again. I said, son, these this these are stepping stones. It's a minor setback. You know, you played during your whole sophomore year, whereas 
I got hurt like the second game of my sophomore, you know, I was out the whole year. Mm. Just trying to be there and to encourage him on these little these little stepping stones that you're going to go through in life. You can't get frustrated. You know, you got to sit back, take a deep breath, and just evaluate the situation. Hey, I still got my legs. I can condition. I can just mm-hmm. squat. I can still run. You should get ready for next year. Mm. He was kind of, kind of sad about it, but I said, that's just life. You know, things happen in life. You know, it's okay to get down, but don't stay down. You got to get up. Ooh, it's okay to get down. Don't stay down. You got to get up. And I'm going to throw something that's so interesting. You know, everything in life happens for a reason. And a lot of times the things that happen in our lives are not always about or for us, right? Mm. Sometimes we go through something, like sometimes I'll read something and it's not for me, it's for a brother that I'm going to coach later, right? Or it's not for me to learn something, it's for this individual who's going to have a question about some relationship scenario. Or it's not for me, it's for this neighbor that has a question about this thing that they're going through. I'm here to pass that information on to them. So experiences happen the same way. And you mentioned your son, you know, he broke his one hand early this season, got the cast off, and then he broke the other one later in the season. So he's dealing with disappointment. But then I think back to his daddy, who, you know, he said some challenges growing up or whatever, you know, got a little bit of trouble here or there. But then he got the UT, thought he was going to the NFL, but then his dreams got squashed, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you fast forward 20 years later, He's running a successful food truck and he's actually catering for the UT football team, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. I've I've been over there, I think think I've been over there like two or three times this year. It was a good experience. But but I'm just saying, but, but, but you see what I'm saying? It's just like football brought you, right? That was one of the things that helped you to get here. And Mm -hmm. now, you're doing something in a capacity in which you're still connected with football because what's the, what's the name of your food truck? Smith's end zone barbecue. Smith's end zone barbecue. So there's this through line here that's all connected. And you said something earlier about how, when you, you know, when you pray and you say you prayed for God to, you know, you wanted to get to the NFL, right? You got to the NFL. You just didn't play in the NFL. But the thing is, you're praying for success. And so now you're still affiliated with football, but just in a different capacity. So now mm-hmm. you're feeding football players, you're feeding athletes, you're feeding coaches, you're feeding fans, you're doing mm-hmm. all of this and you're still connected to it just in a different capacity. So you're still in that direction. Mm-hmm. It's just not necessarily the way or the, the way that you initially planned it. Right. Right. Exactly. So I, I love it. I love it. I love what I do. I love I, the passion for it. Mm, mm. So, so what's next then? So, I mean, you got the Smith's end zone barbecue, the food truck. Do you have any other, you know, big plans or visions for the, for the brand itself? Um, yeah. Going forward? yeah. My wife, she's trying to, we're trying to get her into PA school. Uh, okay. So once she get in and get settled and get out, uh, of course, I'd like to have like a brick and more or like a restaurant. Uh I, I'm me personally. I like the food truck because I can go where people's at. You know, mm-hmm. And with a with a, a restaurant, it's like oh, I got people got to come to me now. So mm-hmm. I may just end up doing both. Mm-hmm. But you I know, you know what's but you know what's interesting though, man. You think about the last almost two years and what we've dealt with, right? The mm-hmm. pandemic, and mm-hmm. you look at how restaurants have, you know, a lot of them struggled and and all of that. But you've had an amazing run with mm-hmm. your food truck. So yeah. it's so again, it's one of those things where sometimes we want this vision or we want this thing to happen a certain way, but mm-hmm. God opens up a door to say, no, you need a food truck. And this food truck, you just said, I can go where people are. I can mm-hmm. keep people distant. They don't have to come inside of me. I can take yeah. this bad boy home. I can park it over here. It's not the same expense as having a brick and mortar location. I mean, yeah. it's amazing how this thing comes together, brother. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having a storefront, but it's just like the overhead, man. It's just uh, and you with the with the restaurant, you got to be open, you know, five, six, seven days a week. Mm-hmm. Food truck, I set my own schedule. You set your own schedule, and and so my thing is, why would you even? Why would you go otherwise? You like your right. schedule, you know? <laughs> just figure out a way to, to to if you need more, figure out a way to accelerate it a little bit. But dude, yeah. man, I'm proud of you, dude. You living that Appreciate life, brother. 
<laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. And so how can folks who are not in Knoxville, how can they follow you, link up with you on social media, and then people in the Knoxville area, how can they connect with you and learn more about it and come out and support uh, Smith's End Zone Barbecue? I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, I have my phone number and email on there. That's the best way to reach me. Okay, so on Facebook and Instagram, what is the, is it Smith's End Zone Barbecue? Is that the name of it? Yeah. Okay, I got you. I made sure to have the tag in the in the show notes here, Smith's End Zone Barbecue. So if y'all are in the Knoxville area, make sure to follow Smith's End Zone Barbecue and go get some grilled stuff from Chavis Smith and his family because they do the doggone thing. And I, I can fully endorse the brisket. Like, man, that doggone brisket, I, I'm, I think I need to come get me a, a feel pretty soon. But that brisket, man, y'all... Put it this way, just 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 let them know Mike D said come get that brisket. You know what I'm saying? But um, but y'all definitely follow Smith's End Zone Barbecue on all social media outlets. If you're in Knoxville, find them, check that, check them out, figure out where they're gonna be located this week, this day, whatever. Get in touch with them, reach out, shoot Chavis a DM, let them know you heard about them on Black Fathers Now. If you're not in the Knoxville area, shoot them a DM. Let them know that, hey, his story was amazing. You learned something from his story and it's going to help you to approach life a little bit differently because we got to encourage brothers who are doing the doggone thing to keep doing the doggone thing because we all benefit from that. Yes. No doubt, no doubt. Is there anything you want to leave us with, brother? No, man, I just appreciate your time. <laughs> well, a man of few words, huh? <laughs> you know me. <laughs> I know, man. I just playing with you, dog. But no, nah, man, I appreciate you, man. I salute you and continue to do the doggone thing. Fellas, 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 as always, make sure to follow Black Fathers Now on all social media outlets. Subscribe, leave ratings, share this episode out. Literally, it's going to change somebody's life. Listen to Chavis Smith's story. Don't give up. Do the doggone thing. And until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I holler at you. Peace. Yo, fellas, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And always, always, always visit blackfathersnow.com as well as follow Black Fathers Now on virtually every social media platform you can think of. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. Just follow us and uh, and engage with us, man. Look forward to hearing from you. And uh, I guess until next time, I'll holler at you. Peace.